The holiday of Diwali is a time for lights, fireworks, and most importantly, sweets. So I'm making a 10th century recipe for jalebi, also called zalabia. So thank you to Vite Ramen for sponsoring this video as we celebrate Diwali by making 1,000 year old jalebi, this time on Tasting History. So if today's episode has a theme, and I'm not sure that it does, but if it did, the theme would be things that have many different names and forms. We're going to talk about the festival of Diwali, Diwali! a holiday which I first heard about from The Office, but now I know is perhaps the most diverse holiday I've ever come across. It has many different names, is celebrated by different religions in different regions of the world, and has different origin stories, and is celebrated for different reasons and in different ways. Which makes this dessert pretty apropos, not only because it is served often during Diwali, but also because it has different origins, different names, and many, many different recipe variations. What's amazing is that the first known recipe isn't all that different from the modern version today. What is different is the name. It is called Zalabia, which is actually similar to what they're still called in much of the Middle East, which is where the recipe comes from. It's from the 10th century Baghdadi cookbook Kitab al-Tabi, or The Book of Dishes by Ibn Sayyar al-Warak. And even within this book, there are multiple recipes for it that include different ingredients, different flavors, and it's done in different shapes. But all of them have one thing in common, it's dough that is fried and then soaked in syrup. So really, no matter what you do, you can't go wrong. Now, I'm not going to read the entire recipe because it is really, really long, and partly it's because it is so well written. It's, it's kind of astonishing. I cover a lot of recipes from ancient Rome, medieval Europe, all the way up to the early 20th century, and rare is it to find a recipe as well written as this one. I really, really hope that my cookbook, available for pre-order now, can live up to this 10th century standard. So this recipe starts off with the preparation of the dough. So for that, what you'll need is one cup or 120 grams of all-purpose flour, three tablespoons or 25 grams of gram flour. This is a flour made from brown chickpeas. Usually when you get chickpea flour, it's made from white chickpeas, so this is a bit different, but if that's all you can find, either one will work. A pinch of saffron threads, an optional pinch of cardamom, two tablespoons of rose water, a half cup or 120 milliliters of water, three tablespoons or 45 grams of yogurt, and a pinch of baking soda. So the yogurt and baking soda are actually to help with the fermentation of the dough, and you can use other kinds of yeast for this. What you don't want to use is what is actually in the original recipe, because that was yeast and a small amount of burak al-ajin that has been dissolved in water. That is borax, and today it's usually used in like cleaning products. That's why modern recipes tend to use the yogurt and baking soda to kind of mimic the effect of the borax. So first, soak the saffron in the rose water for 10 minutes, then in a large bowl, whisk together the flowers and baking soda, and if you want to add cardamom, which you should because it's amazing, whisk that in as well. Then add the water, the rose water with saffron, and the yogurt, and whisk until smooth. Now the saffron will give the batter a light yellowish color, but if you want a deeper color, go ahead and add a little bit of food coloring. Even a thousand years ago, they colored these very often, either yellow or orange or green. I'm sticking with kind of an orange, but go with green. Now at this point, you want the batter to be like pancake batter. Honestly, the consistency of the batter is probably the hardest part about this entire recipe. It's, it's kind of one of those things that you just have to play with, and it's going to be a little bit different depending on the weather and everything. But for now, you actually don't really have to worry about it because you're going to cover the bowl and let it ferment for at least 12 hours, which gives you plenty of time to watch some TV, pet the cat, or make yourself a bowl of ramen from today's sponsor, Vite. And I love Vite Ramen, partly because they're based here in the US, and also they are a small company and pay a good living wage. And they make the noodles themselves, so there isn't this cost-cutting race to the bottom that many other brands have. Instead, you're getting high-quality noodles packed with protein, fiber, and other nutrients. A healthier ramen, and a delicious ramen, which is another reason why I really, really like them. Because they are a small company, they are always kind of changing things up based on what their customers say. So 
the, the noodles evolve over time. I think they're on version 3.0 right now. And while the flavor of the noodles and broth are fantastic, they also encourage you to use that kind of as a base for a whole new dish, whether it's just adding a new sauce or using it to build a complex ramen bowl. So to try Vite Ramen yourself, click the link in the description to get a bundle that gives you free gifts and free shipping in the contiguous United States. That is this part. And don't forget to use my code TASTINGHISTORY10 to get an extra 10% off. That's viteramen.com slash tastinghistory, or just click the link below and use my code TASTINGHISTORY10. And hopefully those noodles will hold you over for the 12 to 18 hours that the dough needs to sit and ferment. But once it has, you can make your syrup. For this, what you'll need is four cups or 800 grams of sugar, four tablespoons or 60 milliliters of honey, two cups or 475 milliliters of water, a large pinch of saffron, two tablespoons of rose water, two tablespoons of lemon juice, and again, some optional cardamom. He also gives other flavors that you can use, including musk and camphor. So if you want to use those, you can, but I'm sticking with the rose water, saffron, and cardamom. So take a saucepan and add the sugar, honey, and water, then stir together and set over low heat, slowly bringing the mixture to a light boil. Then you wanna let it simmer until it gets to what's called the thread stage. Now this is between 230 and 234 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's a pretty narrow window, so I definitely encourage you to use a candy thermometer unless you have melted a lot of sugar and can know it by sight. Now as soon as it gets to 230 degrees Fahrenheit, lower the heat and then add in the rose water, lemon juice, saffron, and cardamom and stir everything in. This will help lower the temperature a bit, but it's still going to take a while to cool off to the 150 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit that you want to keep it at for the rest of the process. Now, while it cools, check your dough and make sure there are a few little bubbles on top. There aren't going to be a ton, like if it was a bread dough rising, it's just some activity in there. Also, the consistency might have changed overnight, so you might have to add a little bit more water or flour to it to get it where it needs to be. Where it needs to be is, again, hard to explain. It's thicker than a pancake batter, but not as thick as a cake batter. It needs to kind of be, be free flowing, but not thick enough that it's going to not come out of the five millimeter hole that you're going to have it come out of. See, you're going to fill either a piping bag or a squeeze bottle with the batter and have a about a five millimeter hole at the end. That's what I did, but that's not what the original recipe calls for because he didn't have a squeeze bottle or piping bag. Instead, it's, it's the best part of the recipe. He uses a coconut. Prepare a nut cup for pouring the batter. It is made by cutting off the rounded end of a coconut, which leaves you with a cup-like shell. Pierce a small hole in its bottom the width of a bodkin. Scoop some of the batter into the coconut shell held with the left hand and the hole blocked with a finger. And I kind of wish I had done that. Why didn't I do that? So the last thing to do is to heat up your oil. Again, this is a little dicey because you're going to want to end up frying it at like 330 degrees to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, but you want to start it off a little bit cooler. So bring it up to about 275 degrees Fahrenheit. And that should take a few minutes, which will give us plenty of time to talk about the history of jalebi. A dessert of many names, this jalebi. Zalebi, zolobia, jilapi or mushabak. That's actually the name of the modern version that is usually made during the month of Ramadan. And it gets its modern name from this 10th century recipe, which is technically for zalabia mushabaka, or lattice-shaped zalabia. So with all these different names, nobody really knows the origin of the dish or its name, but my favorite theory is that it was named after Ziryab, who was a 9th century singer, poet, oud player, and composer. He was born in Baghdad, but then became a court musician in Cordoba. Today that is Spain, but at the time it was Al-Andalus. Stories of his exploits are fantastic. He was influential not only in Spanish music today, but also clothing and culture and food. He's often credited with bringing asparagus to the Iberian Peninsula, popularizing drinking wine out of crystal and standardizing the three course meal, soup, main, and the dessert. Now, whether any of that is actually true or not, eh, nobody really knows. I hope it is, and I hope that one of his favorite desserts was a fritter that was named after him. The oldest mention of it being called Zirabia. 
But wherever the name came, the first recipe that we know of was written down in 10th century Baghdad. And it wasn't long after that that the name changed just a little bit, and it appeared in the 1001 Nights of Shahrazad. Of sweet Zolobia chain I hung a necklace around her neck. From its delicious loops I made a ring on her ears. Tasty, if not sticky, jewelry. Now a few centuries later, another recipe appears, again under a slightly different name, this time in 13th century Persia. And it was likely the Persians who brought it to India, where the name changed from Zalabia to Jalebi. The first mention of it coming around 1450 by the Jain author Jinasura, who said how popular they were when served at the feasts of wealthy merchants. Now you can find versions of them from Morocco to Ethiopia all the way over to Nepal. So clearly, everyone who came in contact with this dish thought it was tasty. And unfortunately, at one point, that was used for nefarious purposes. See, in the 1860s, there was a rash of poisonings on the roads of Bengal. People were being poisoned, robbed, and then just left for dead. And hundreds of people ended up being arrested for these crimes. And one of them told the police, the powder we use is made of opium, bang, and datura. That is what is kept in the bag. And the poison is only stated to have been given once in sweet meats, jelabis. So if you find yourself on the roads of Bengal, in the 1860s, you'll, you'll want to watch out. Luckily, today, you should be able to get poison-free jalebi pretty much anywhere in India at any time of year, though they are most popular during Diwali. The auspicious festival of lights which disperses the most profound darkness. In the year 1030, a Persian traveler wrote, When the sun marches in Libra, it is called Diwali. The people dress festively, they ride to the temples to give alms, and play merrily with each other till noon. In the night, they light a great number of lamps in every place so that the air is perfectly clear. People wear new and colorful clothes and they decorate their houses with colored garlands and rangoli, which are ornate patterns painstakingly made from colored sand, rice, or flower petals. But it is the lamps that give Diwali its name. The word comes from a Sanskrit word meaning row of lights. And there are rows of lights absolutely everywhere at this time of year. One 15th century Venetian merchant wrote of the spectacle when he traveled to India. They fix up within their temples and on the outside of the roofs an innumerable number of lamps of oil, which are kept burning day and night. Though this is hardly the first mention of the practice. It is mentioned in early Hindu texts, which says, On the night of the 13th day of the fortnight of Karik month, lighting of the Yamdipa will prevent untimely death. So while the lamps are literal light, the holiday itself is about figurative light. Light conquering darkness, good conquering evil, knowledge conquering ignorance. In the Jain religion, it celebrates the anniversary of the day in 527 BCE that Mahavira, the 24th and final Tirthankara, or great teacher, achieved moksha, or the release from earthly reincarnation. The gods illuminated Pavanagari by lamps to mark the occasion. Since that time, the people of Bharat celebrate this famous festival of Dipalika to worship Lord Mahavira on the occasion of his nirvana. That was written in the year 705, and by then, the festival had been around for probably around 2,000 years at least. And so it was known by many names by then and celebrated by many different people for different reasons. Even in Hinduism, there are multiple reasons to celebrate the holiday. It's associated with different stories. One of the most common comes from the epic Ramayana. And it is 24,000 verses long and has like tens of thousands of named characters. So obviously I'm not going to be able to tell you the entire story right now, but in a nutshell, it covers the life of Prince Rama and his defeat of the demon king Ravan and his subsequent return from a 14-year exile to rule the kingdom of Kosala, his return being celebrated with lamps and festivities. And while I can't go through the entire epic, because it is, it is epic, you really should check it out for yourself, because it is a fantastic story and has some wonderful characters. There are demons, palace intrigue, and an army of monkeys led by my favorite character, Hanuman, a monkey with super strength and the ability to leap over oceans, who after having his tail lit on fire when he was in captivity, escapes by burning down the demon city of Lanka. It's fantastic, so definitely check it out. There have been lots of movies and shows about it. It's, it's really, really great. 
Anyway, while that is one reason to celebrate Diwali, there are many others. Many use it to worship Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and prosperity, and Ganesha, god of wisdom. In some sects of Buddhism, it is the observance of the day King Ashoka the Great adopted Buddhism. And for Sikhs, it is the anniversary of the release of Guru Hargobind and 52 Rajas, or princes, from a Mughal prison under Emperor Jahangir in the early 17th century. Again, the name of the holiday is different, but the celebrations are often intertwined. And th the holiday, Diwali and all of its other forms, are not just a way to honor these past events, but also honor people in the present. Neighbors welcome each other and their families into their homes with gifts and fireworks and lavish meals, which of course include lots of sweets, like jalebi, which I am about to finish. So once your batter, syrup, and oil are all ready, the recipe says, let the batter run through the hole into the hot fat, simultaneously moving your hand in circles to make the lattice form. If your batter was done right, the moment the batter falls into the hot oil, it will puff and look like a bracelet with a hollow interior. Easier said than done. Really, your batter has to be perfect and the oil temperature has to be, but after a little while, you'll get it. I did. It took a lot of ugly ones before I got it, but I did get it. So you're letting a constant stream of batter form a spiral in the oil and then cross it into the center so that it doesn't come apart. Like I said, they need to fry at about 330 to 350 degrees, but if you put them in at that temperature, I found for me that it, it hardens too quickly and they kind of break apart. So I started at 275 or 280, put the batter in and then cranked it up and let it heat up. Even then, it only takes about a minute on one side, then you flip it and fry it a minute on the other and they're done. And as soon as they're done, you take the jalebi and put them into the sugar syrup. You wanna let them sit for about a minute because you're not just coating them, they need time to soak up that syrup. And once they're all fried and syruped, you can garnish with a bit of pistachio and they're ready to eat. And here we are, 10th century Zalabia or Jalebi. So here's one that's not quite the exact shape that I want, but um, pretty darn close. And I'm sure if I did them again, I'd get them get even better by the next time. But for now, let's have a go. So crunchy. That is surprising, because it's been a little while while I've been filming. Um, still super crunchy, absolutely fantastic. So they're sweet, but they're not sac saccharine. Like they're not just overly sweetened. I was a little worried they would be. What you're getting instead are all those other flavors, the cardamom, the saffron, the, the rose water, but none of them are overwhelming. None of, it's not like, rose water, you know, which can happen. And, and the same with, with saffron. I think anything that you put in here, it just kind of comes together. Um, those are really, really good. Yeah. And the original recipe actually lets you know how they're supposed to turn out. The well-made ones should feel brittle and dry to the bite and crumble and fall apart in the mouth. On the other hand, if they turn out to be soft and leathery when eaten, they are not good. I agree, and what's amazing is that he actually gives the reasons why they would turn out that way and ways to, to fix it for the next time you do. I mean, everything from adding different ingredients to the, the weather outside and, you know, wait until it's drier. It, it's a really fantastic recipe. Now, while these are fantastic, uh, and now maybe my favorite Indian dessert, there is another Indian dessert that I love that I've made here on the channel called Payasam. So if you haven't seen that video, make sure to check it out, and I will see you next time on Tasting History. There are like 40 of these. I can't eat them all, but I might eat them all.